Um, yesterday, we had a, a, an excellent day. There's um, family members of the Turners here. It's good to see Mal and Al here as well. Al Mal. Um, to see them as well, to see the fact that they got to enjoy Caleb being married. And it's, it's a wonderful day to be able to watch a wedding take place. Um, wonderful to see Caleb getting married. Uh, um, but one of the things when it comes to the weddings, I think all of us sort of know that there's that moment you're, you're standing there. Everybody stands up. The bride is coming down and there's the excitement. And one of the things that becomes apparent, and everybody says the same, is how beautiful they look, because that is the day where they look their best. And I think it's the case that sometimes there are moments you sort of have to feel sorry for the lady, for the bride, because you sort of think, what do they think of her the rest of the time? If they're sort of saying this is the best day, but it is the day you look forward to. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when it comes to ourselves and how we see ourselves, we often will recognize the fact that we are sinners, we fall short of who God wants us to be. And the issue is that we know when we come together on Sundays, we are not the most beautiful people. And I don't mean that in the sense of physical looks. I mean in the spiritual sense. We know we come. We know our sin. We know we've done what we've done wrong. We know that even we come this morning, and there's probably things that have come up this morning that have happened that we've done that we sort of regret. But the good thing is in the gospel what Jesus does for us. And this is what um, Paul writes about in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been promised in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And it's this wonderful reminder of the gospel in two parts of it. First, first one is the fact that God makes us and presents us holy and blameless before him through what Jesus has done for us. In other words, the beauty we don't know about ourselves, the sinless perfection, the, the, the perfect nature, God will see to us like that. And when we stand before him in the last day, we'll be able to say that we have a right standard with him and we can look forward to it. But here's the second one, and this is the important one for us. We have to continue in the faith to see that. When we meet together on Sundays, there is a reminder to persevere. Keep on going. Because I think some Sundays we come and the feeling is, is this worth it? And there's occasions we maybe want to lie in bed a bit longer. We want to be able to just spend a bit of time having a bit more rest. Is it important for us to go? And then we start to think of our own spiritual walk. Is it worth the, the commitment? Is it worth the pain? Is it worth the loss? Well, given what Jesus does for us, absolutely. And Paul writes and says, we have to continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. So when we're here together now, when we sing, we're singing to each other, keep on going. When we pray, we're praying together to say, keep on going. And when we listen to God's word proclaimed, it is to say to us, keep on going. So today is a day that we're able to rejoice that God one day will present us blameless, but also the reminder, keep on going to enjoy the salvation that Christ has died to buy us. And with that in mind, we're going to sing because all of our hope is in the fact that Jesus is alive, that what he has done is perfect. When he rose, it was perfectly concluded. So we're going to sing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I think it's number 52 in the books. Let's all stand together and we'll sing now. Let's all stand. sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my sin Oh
together um, as we continue our worship class till our hearts let's pray to God. Uh, Father we do thank you for your grace that there is this wonderful uh, privilege that we enjoy. There is a beauty in the gospel that calls us to to enjoy what Christ has done for us. Father we thank you that those things aren't hidden. We thank you that they aren't kept from us but wonderfully in clear descriptive languages words we're told of the splendor of what Jesus has done. Father we thank you that we are redeemed. We thank you we are forgiven. But Father, we do thank you one day we will be presented to you blameless. Father, thank you one day we will stand before you knowing that our forgiveness is perfectly bought through Jesus. But in the meantime, Father, we do pray for each of us that you would help us to keep on going, to keep on trusting Jesus and to put him first. Father, we realize that for all of us here, there's different life experiences at different ages. There's some that we, we don't know our times. We don't know how long we have left in life. But Father, we do rejoice that whatever you give us, that in your grace you will keep us to the final end. Father, may that hope cause us to spur on with excitement to serve you. But Father, we do pray for our own hearts now. We pray that we would be receptive to you and to your word. Father, we pray that we would seek your glory. But also, Father, as we come to your word, recognizing that it is contrary to what the world tells us, we pray for that right understanding to say that this is what is necessary for us to glorify your name. So Father, be with us now. Help us, we pray, as a church. May there be that communal sense, that community understanding that we are doing this, not as individuals, but as a church, that as we sing, as we pray, and we call you our Father, may there be that delight. But Father, we do pray for the grace on those who aren't with us. We recognize and realize that there are are, are some who would love to be, but because of ill health or other reasons are unable to be here. Father, we pray for grace with them. Father, we pray that they would feel your presence that they would be reminded of your love. And, and while they can't be here with us physically, may the comfort of our prayers give hope as well for them, knowing that you are the God who loves them and cares for them and knows each person in their individual predicaments and that you can be trusted. So, Father, be with us now. We thank you that our Saviour li- lives. May that give us the hope and the assurance that drives us forward. And we pray this all to the glory of your name. Amen. 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 Um, for those who have been here over the last number of Sundays, we've started to read through week after week through John's Gospel. And we're going to continue that. I'm going to read it this week. And we're up into John 3. John 3, verse 22. And we're going to read down to verse 36. It's John the Baptist exalts Christ. Now, I should say a couple of things. One of them is for those that will watch YouTube afterwards, the camera isn't working. So uh, that might be a blessing that you don't have to see my face when you get home. But if you listen, there's no video camera. And the other one as well, there's a couple of us because last night we have squeaky voices. So if at some point our voice breaks or something, please ignore it. Don't laugh too much. But it might happen that somebody's voice just breaks and and squeaks a bit. That's because of last night. Um, But we're going to read now. 
John 3, verse 22. And this is John the Baptist. We, we've just finished with the great declaration of what Jesus has come to do, the, the wonderful grace that God is going to give if we trust Jesus. And then it says, verse 22, After this, Jesus and, and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing as at Aon, Aon near Selim, because water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. End of reading there, verse 36. Just a couple of passing comments, brief comments to make. Um, one of them is, when we talk about John's Gospel, you might hear people say about John the Evangelist. And the reason why they say that is because John's Gospel is an evangelistic letter. It's written for people to believe in Jesus. Uh, and he's come to this conclusion where he says there, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And there is that key part for us to ask the question, are we trusting Jesus? Is our faith in Jesus? But the other part of it as well is, John's life has one purpose, one goal, one intention. He's not a person with numerous callings. He's not a per person with numerous purposes. He comes with one intention, point to Jesus. And as he says, I must decrease so that he must increase. In other words, what he's saying is, if Jesus is to be glorified, I need to make little of myself and much of Jesus. And there's a case for us here this morning to be reminded that we need to make much of our Savior because of what he is, what he has done for us, and who he is in his character and nature. He came down to earth to save us. Let's make much of him. Let's rejoice in him. Let's glorify him. With that in mind, I'll pray briefly, and then I'll explain a couple of things. But let me pray briefly after we've heard God's word. Father, we do thank you for the, the, the beauty here that we read of what John says. Father, we pray for each of us here that we would make much of Jesus. We pray that whether as children or adults, we would love Jesus. We pray at times where people maybe cause us to question who he is. We pray for those times to be able to say he is truly the Son of God. He is God incarnate. But Father, may we make much of him. May we decrease so that he would be seen in his glory. Father, may we not think of ourselves more special than we are, but may we recognize that Jesus deserves all praise and all glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just a couple of announcements um, to make. Uh, first of all, this week on Tuesday, like I say, all of August will be prayer meetings every Tuesday. We'll be praying together on Tuesday. Next Sunday, George, Lord willing, will be preaching for us. I'll be the first one, so pray for George in his preparation and things. But now I'm going to hand over to Nicole. Nicole is, is planning to go to do a year out with a group called Agape, and she's going to share a bit about what she's going to do. So Nicole, if you come now. Thank you, thanks. Good morning everyone, um, I'm Nicole, um, I recently graduated from university and I'm planning to work with a Christian charity called Agape. So, um, 
Agape is a UK missions organisation that exists to help people discover Jesus. So we do this through helping Christians grow in their faith and in confidence in sharing their faith with their non-Christian friends. And um, we seek to help non-Christians discover who Jesus is and have the opportunity to respond to his invitation of faith. So the latest statistics in the UK say that the percentage of the population actively following Jesus is between 3 and 6%. And it's been found that the majority of people don't feel equipped to share their faith with the people around them. So Agape's mission in collaboration with the Christian Church is to reach the 97% and to equip the 3% to do the same. So we've got six branches of ministry, one for university students, one for ambassadors and politicians, one for professional athletes, one for families of married couples, um, and one for people in need of humanitarian aid. And we also have an online ministry to reach people with the gospel online. So um, I'm going to be working with university students. And our vision at Agape Students is to enable all students to hear the gospel message of salvation, which offers redemption and healing both to the individual and to the world as a whole. So as an intern, I'll be sharing the gospel with students on different university campuses like UCL, King's College London and City University. Um, I'll also be mentoring Christian students and helping them grow in their faith and in confidence in sharing their faith with their non-Christian friends. Um, I'll be meeting regularly with the rest of my team to pray together and to plan outreaches and socials. And Agape is very much committed to my own spiritual growth, so I myself will receive training and will be mentored by a member of staff. So um, Agape and other mission organisations can't do the work that we've been called to do without the help of our ministry partners. So these are the people who pray for and or financially support our work. So each member of Agape staff, from the national director all the way down to the newest staff member, develops a group of individuals and churches who pray for them, encourage them and give to all their financial needs. Um, as an organisation, we believe that it's a privilege to watch God work and provide for the needs of our staff through this team. And it builds our faith and theirs as we work together toward the fulfilment of the Great Commission. Um, so I encourage you all to pray about partnering with me financially, but I would greatly appreciate your prayers during the year. And I'll be sending out specific prayer points in my newsletters, which you can ask to receive. So please do speak to me after church if you'd like to be added to my list and if you'd like to know how you can give to my ministry. Alternatively, I have put a sh um, some brochures at the back, which you can pick up for more details. So yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for that. Um, and, and do, like she says, Nicole says, speak with her afterwards about what it is she's going to do and then how we can best support her as a church. And also, September's coming very quickly, so it's not going to be long until Nicole will be going out to do her year uh, venture. Um, so I, we'll pray for Nicole in, in a second after we read, and then we'll sing, and then we'll pray. Um, but we're going to read 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, um, verse 1 through to verse 13. Uh, and what, what we're going to be looking at is within keeping of the, the one-offs, um, given an answer for the hope that is found in us. And the question is, given an answer for the idea of the world's end and given what we're uh, looking at around us, what people write, what people say. So we're going to read 2 Peter 3, verse 1 through to verse 13. In case you don't know how to get to Peter, uh, you get Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. If you get Revelation, go back a few books and you'll get to 2 Peter that way. Um, so Hebrews is a fairly big book, Revelation fairly big book as well. Their book ends near enough and you go in towards, you'll get, eventually get to 2 Peter 3. So 2 Peter 3. I'm going to read from verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. And both of them I'm stirring up, to in, to, is stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? 
For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed uh, long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the, the coming of the Lord, the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved? And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We'll end our reading there at the end of verse 13. Um, we're going to sing once more. Um, I think we're going to stand to sing I'm Special. And the collection will be taken up then as well. So let's all stand together to sing I'm Special. No. Special because God has loved me, for He gave the best thing that He had to save me. His own Son, Jesus, crucified to take the blame for all the bad things I have done. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. I know I don't deserve anything. Help me feel your love right now, to know deep in my heart that I'm your special friend. I special because God has loved me for he gave the best thing that he has to save me his own son Jesus crucified to take the blame for all the bad things I have done Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. I know I don't deserve anything. Help me feel your love right now, to know deep in my heart that I'm your special friend. That's good. Uh, let's uh, pray then once more, and then we're going to look at the passage of 2 Peter that we read. So let's uh, pray once more. Father, we do thank you for your grace. We do thank you that there is um, something privileged that we enjoy, that we are more than just simply made in your image, but as your children, that we can call you our Father, that you love us, and that there is that, that reality that we are special in, in a sense that many others don't enjoy. Father, may we not see that as a privilege that we have deserved, May we see it in light of grace and in the fact that you are God who is kinder to us than we can even begin to consider or fathom or deserve. But Father, we do pray as well for ourselves as a church and all that we do. We, we thank you for Nicole's desire to go out to serve you. 
We do pray for her in the preparation leading up to September. We pray for the things we need to work out as a church well, but we pray for her. We pray for the work that she'll be involved in. We pray most of all for godliness from it. We pray that this would cause a, a love for Jesus. We pray for those moments where there's a need to answer well. We pray for that grace there. Father, we do pray for good Christian friends as well to be around, but we do pray most of all that out of this year that there would be a sense of gladness that Nicole has done this because of the benefit it's been for her spiritually. But Father, we do pray as we pray for her as a church and consider the, the work that we're called to in sharing the good news with people around us. We pray for our commitment to what we're doing. Father, we pray that we would love the Great Commission, that we would love what we're called to. But Father, may we see baptisms. We rejoice in Raphael, the recent baptism there. We thank you for the encouragement that was for us as a church. We, we long for more. Father, may Raphael be one of, of others as well who look at his example and say, this is good for me to do. But for us now as a church now, as we come to your word, we pray you'd help us to focus, to give our attention to you, and to say that this is important because we are listening to our King's voice. God is speaking as we hear his word talked about. Father, may we recognize that this is your word. May we see it and treat it seriously. And may our attention be realizing that this is right for us to do. And we pray this all to the glory of your name. Amen. 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 So have your Bibles open to 2 Peter 3. And like I say, over the, the, the weeks we've been looking at, uh, in and out really, this idea of giving an answer for the hope that is to be found in us. And considering the fact that, you know, we're able to answer the fact that we're adopted by God, God's character, His love for us, things like that. But the question is, okay, I thought one week would be good for us to think about the world that we're in and how do we think about the way that it's talked about. I think it's not, it won't be a surprise for us, but when you look at any article that talks about the world, the general article will say everything is all gloomy, everything is doomed, and the world is going to be destroyed very quickly. So I don't think any of us have avoided or been able to ignore the things that come up on news, newspapers and stuff like that, that the world is getting worse and it's going to be destroyed by, if we don't step in and sort it out. So, so you get the articles that say, you know, kind of, oh, it's as warmest it's ever been. Oh, oh, it's, it's, it's at the worst it's ever been. It's at the wettest it's ever been. Oh, it's at this. And everything is put in extreme. And every time we look at it in the news, and for those at school, realize it's a big part and parcel at school, the feeling could be, oh, how can we live in this world when everything's so doomed? And part of the issue is that we forget that as Christians, we are called to believe something that is different. Now, we're not called to believe something that's different just for the sake of being different. We're not contrarians. We're not just, oh, I like the controversy, so I'm going to be different. But it's different because our view of the world is based on who God is and what God is like. Therefore, what God says will always take precedent. And when it comes to the news... The news will always have a bias that is against God because they are written by non-Christians. The majority of the news that we will read and hear are not read by people or written by people who have a worldview of a God who is involved in creation, loves his creation, and keeps his creation. So for us as believers, when we see the news, we have to remind ourselves that we're at odds with them. The other part as well is news only works when it scares monks. It doesn't work unless you're afraid. And that's the, the whole point of it. The news is there to make you afraid. But the question is, how are we to think of the world that we're in? And uh, given all the stuff that goes on, all the statements that you hear, how do we think about the world that we're in and what's going to come? What is going to happen? Is the world going to end? If so, how is it going to end? Is it man's destruction that brings about the end? Or is it something else? Is it our lack of doing stuff? Is that going to cause it? Is our use of fossil fuels, is that going to do it? Uh, what's going to be the answer? What's going to be the remedy? Uh, and when you read people, like they, they have the article say, if we don't step in, next 10 years, we're all doomed. And we pass the 10 years, what happens? So how do we think about it with the world? And looking at 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 3, I think this gives an answer for how we're to think about the world and what the world is going to come to, because Peter does tell us in detail what we should expect. Now, he doesn't tell us the precise particulars, but he does give a sense of, this is what God says. Here's how you should think. So a few things to consider. But the first thing is to remind yourself that humanity does have a call to the earth. Humanity does have a concern for the earth, and it is right for us to be concerned about the earth. 
It isn't wrong for us to be concerned about the world that we're in because we are made to care for the world and to see that we are ruling over it as God has appointed. So just one example of this, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God is speaking about what is about to take place and he says, then God said, let us make man in our image um, after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And what he's saying is that the man is given a responsibility to be over it, not only in their special nature that they are made in the image of God, but also they're to be over it in the sense of rule. They're to care for it. They're to, to look, nurture it. They're to look after it. So, so man's goal and human, humanity's goal in the earth is to say we should be concerned about the earth. So it's not wrong for us to say we should be concerned. It's not wrong for us to say, oh, there's certain things that we could do that we shouldn't do, stuff like that. It's not wrong. But the issue is that the way that it's being put is not that type of idea. The way that it's being put is we are responsible for the world continuing. That, that's a very different thing. It's a very different thing from saying God is in control and God decides what humanity should do with the world to saying God is given humanity over to rule the world so that if it gets destroyed, it's their fault. Very different things. So what does Peter say with this in mind? What is Peter's point? What is Peter talking about? So let's look and see. 2 Peter chapter 3, um, that we read there. The first thing is the fact that there is a consistent issue with humanity. Humanity has a consistent issue. And it starts out there, verse 1, Peter is referring to a letter he has written before. Now, depending on who you read, some people will say it's definitely 1 Peter. Some say, oh, no, it can't be 1 Peter. It has to be something else. But the main part is this. Peter, when he writes, has had the right before to say this is a common issue. This is a problem that's happening again and again and again. And this is a problem that isn't stopping this is a problem that's going to keep on going. And what the issue is, what the problem is, that humanity disputes God. Humanity does not like to consider God as being a true and faithful good God. And you read here, you see this, okay? Where here is Peter, and Peter is referring to the work that's about to take place, and he says here, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. And both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of, by, of reminder, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue and are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And what's going on, what he's saying there is that the people are going to look and they're going to say, God doesn't keep his word. God says Jesus is going to come back. God says there's going to be a return, but where is it? And what they say is they just ridicule. They just mock. They say, well, where is Jesus? Where, where is he? I haven't seen him yet. He's not back now. You know, it's been how many years? It's been 2,000 years. You know, uh, he's not here. But, but it's not even then. It's a case of saying even after a couple of years, people are saying, where, where is this Jesus? Where's he come back? And he says there as well, what they say is, well, look, if God's really going to make a big deal of the world, and God's going to come back in this wonderful way, why does the world keep on going? Why does it keep on doing the same things over and over again? Why does the world behave in the same way? If God's going to sort it out, surely he's not going to just let it just act the same way. And what they're saying is they're ridiculing God, and they're disputing God, questioning God's character, similar to Eve, because their statement says, I can't see it, therefore it doesn't happen. And with that, you get to see that here are these people coming, they question God, they dispute God, they dispute God's word, and the reason why they do it is because they forget history or they rewrite write it. And this is where you get then verse 5, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world then that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heaven and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. And what he says here, he says, you know, the people, what they seem to be saying is, but why on earth would God make the world? Why would God keep the world? 
Why, why would God allow the world to keep on going but then destroy it? Because surely if he's making it, he, he loves it. And if he's keeping it, he cares for it. And if he loves and cares for it, why would he destroy it? And what, they, what he says and Peter as a response is, remember the flood. Remember Noah. Remember what happened. Who is it that makes the water? God. Who is it that upholds creation? God. Who is it that brings about judgment through his word by the water that he makes? God. And the point he's saying is that God is not somebody that just simply makes creation, keeps creation, and then won't judge it. He says, look at history. Look at what God has done in the past. It's not new. It's not the case that God is just about going to do something he's never done before. Peter is having the right to them to say to the believers here, remember God does this, and God has done this. And the sad part is the reason why people dispute God and God's character, God's nature, is because they ignore what history says. They ignore what God has said and the way that he has done it before in the past. And their viewpoint is, well, well why would God do it now? And the reason why they think that is because they ignore history. Now, we're in a, in a generation, in an era, C.S. Lewis refers to like the chronological snobbery. And he talks about the fact that new things always seem to be better than older things and not always being the case. And he says, you know, people looking down in their generation sometimes feeling more superior than others. And part of the issue as well nowadays is not simply the fact of feeling more superior, it's the ignoring the history because we don't like parts of it that we end up doing the same issues. And what's going on here, what Peter is talking about is the, these people are just ignoring so much of the history. And that's causing the question, is God going to keep his word? And the reason why is because they have made a God that isn't consistent with the Bible. And with that then, they have misunderstood that God is a merciful God, that God is kind and God is loving. And the reason why he hasn't judged the world in the way he will is not because he's forgetting. It's not because he's doing something contrary. It says there, according to verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some kind of slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. And now, when it comes to the world, the way that they, they treat it, they sort of say, you know, kind of the, 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 everything's going on, it's going to continue on, and like I say, we're responsible for the destruction. And the moment that happens, that puts man at the center, and it says, they are the arbiter of judgment, they are the decider of judgment, and God is not to be in the center. And the outcome then is naturally to say, well, God isn't doing something because he's lazy, because he's tired, because he's quiet, or because he's not even there. And what Peter says is actually the opposite. Peter's saying to the people, he says, the reason why God hasn't judged it yet is because he's being kind to you. And the reason why after 2,000 years he hasn't bought it at the end is not because God is forgetting his promises. The reason why is because God wants us to be saved. And this is what it says there, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise of some kind of slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should re reach repentance. Now, this is why we have again, in the worldview of having God as creator, Christ as the center, that every other group cannot offer. We offer the hope of salvation. And we're able to give a reason to say, this is why the world keeps on going. And this is why the world keeps on going until God decides at the end, it's because he wants people to be saved. And that we're able to say to people every single morning they wake up, the reason why you're awake is because God wants you to repent. And the reason why God has not judged the world yet is so that you can know him. And the fact that God is a merciful and gracious God causes the people to question, is God really who he says he is? So for them, they dispute God's character because they forget the fact that God is being merciful. God isn't just doing it because he has other things going on. God does it because he is a kind and merciful God that wants people to know him. So what he is doing is a patient act where he's saying, I want each person to know me. So that we're able to say when people get the doom and the gloom, the fear about the world, we're able to say, here's the good thing. God's not judging it now because he wants you to know him. To be able to rejoice, to be able to give thanks that each person that's been given life has been given it so that they would be saved. And for us to be able to rejoice that God has allowed us to even be here today, to be reminded of our need to repent, to trust in Christ, and the reminder is that God gives us breath every single day to return to him. See how good God is for that. To think that God could decide, I'm done with you. To think that God could say, I'm not going to give you breath today, but he allowed it. 
And he allows us to hear his word, to come before him. And the reason why we're on this planet able to enjoy this is not because coincidentally the world is kept on going, but it's soon going to be destroyed based on what we've done. It's a statement of God and his control and his authority is allowing us to be here because he's been kind and gracious to us. So what is it then God is promising about the world? Because it's one thing then these scoffers are coming They're disputing God and God's character, God's nature. What is it then that God has promised that that Peter refers to? Uh, And there's a number of things to to pick up here. First of all, that he has said that God will judge the world. God is the one who will judge the world. As as you read here, he says, um, we'll read, (coughs) sorry, verse 7. He says, but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist, are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And then you get on down then, if you read a bit on down to verse 11 onwards, he says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the day, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt, uh, melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And there's a few things obviously there. The first thing is that we are being set for judgment. And he says that the world will be judged. The world one day will be destroyed by judgment of God. And it's going to be a more global scale than what Noah seen. It's going to be more than simply just a a cataclysmic event that happens for the humanity that lives on the earth. This is all of creation ceasing to be what it is now and becoming something different. And the reason why is that one day there is going to be a judgment on the world. That there is going to be a judgment that the world as it is now is not what God has intended or wanted because of the sin in it. That means that our sin affects not just simply the world, the the people in the world, but the world we live in. In other words, it means that the the issues that we see, the decay, the rot, the the ruin, is not because of people being wicked, it's because the world has fallen apart in some ways. Because God has not meant it in the way that it's become because of sin. Now that doesn't mean that it's gotten worse. It doesn't mean that the world is becoming more and more decayed or something like that. But in the sense that since Adam and Eve sinned, there's been decay that is part of it. So it just is continuously reminding us of the mess And with that then, the judgment isn't just simply on the world, but it is also the people in the world. That every single person who is living in this world one day will be judged by God, and just because God has not done it yet does not mean God will not do it. So some people think, well, God hasn't done it yet, so I can ignore it. They're they're able to say, well, well, God hasn't judged us yet, so I'm able to sit back, I'm able to relax. And and you get the t-shirts, you know, kind of, uh, Jesus come and look busy. And this idea that this idea that sets up, you know, kind of, well, he hasn't come back yet, so really, why are these guys going on about this? Peter says, no, it's coming. There's going to be a judgment day where we will stand before God, and that day will be a final day where we will have that last moment, where we're beyond even that last moment, and we'll stand before God, and God will say whether we are with him or not, and we are judged. Like I say, God in his grace and his kindness allows each person to live so that they can miss that day as a day of judgment, but it's a day of hope. And with that as well then, that God has decided for something better in the world. Not only is he going to judge the world, because that seems negative and doom and gloom, but what is the positive that he talks about here? Well, he says that God has planned something even better. And you get there, verse 11, like we read, he says, since all these things are, are thus to be dissolved, in other words, the world, the heavenly bodies, the, things, the, the, the earthly bodies that we live in and stuff like that, he says, all these are being dissolved, all these going away. He says, waiting and hastening for the day, of the, the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What he says is, we're not to pin all our hope in this world and say, this is the best. This is not the best. This is why like, people rightly say, you know, when Joel Osteen says, your best life now is right to ridicule it because if this is it, honestly, it's terrible. But as he says here, Peter says, it gets better. And he says, there's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. 
There's going to be a perfect rule. There's going to be righteousness. There's going to be the wonderful, beautiful privilege of being with God, and we will get to enjoy it if we are in Christ. Now, here is where the hope is, that God is offering us something good that we can look forward to. Now, I realize that the different things will cause controversy and all, but one thing to say, the just up oil people do not give any hope. The just up oil people do not allow anyone to feel any better about the world they're in. Because you see them and there's either anger or dismay. And the fear is, what will we do with the world that we're in? Surely it's all about to be destroyed. And our feeling is, is this it? They're not able to offer anything better. They're not able to offer anything that gives something to go to bed at night and wake up in the morning and say, even if I don't wake, I know something better is coming. But here's what God says. That God in his grace and his kindness says that there is something wonderful ahead for us. In other words, what Just Up Oil does, and I realize I'm just using them as an example, so there's many other examples, Just Stop Oil give anxiety, fear, and panic. And what does God give? Grace, love, and hope. And when you read in 2 Peter 3, he is saying, look at the world you're in. Look at how wonderful you think it is. It's going to be even better than that. It's going to be beautiful and perfect and splendid, and you get to be there. And he says, look forward to it. That doesn't mean that we ignore the commands that God gives for us in Genesis and the way we look at humanity over creation, stuff like that. But he sent us, look for it in you heaven and the earth. And he says, but according to the promise, we are waiting for it. Our eyes and our attention is say, there's something better to come. But what does God want us to do then? And what does God want us to know in this? What is the outcome that we're to have? You know, like I say, if there's hope in this, what is the purpose? What is the goal? Now, in, in this, it, it's interesting that uh, what, what we have in, in English can be hard to kind of work out, you know, where are the commands and all. But, but in Greek, they have a thing that they talk about imperatives. And imperatives are the commands that we are given, to, to what to do. Now, the command, strangely, is not one that I think you would look at and say, oh, that's going to be the command. But in one part, there's this command that Peter gives that we could ignore that is absolutely vital for the way we look at the world and the way we are to continue on living in the world. And that's verse 8, where he says, verse 8, But do not over overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So that word overlook is the only command. Do not overlook is the only command in that whole section. And the reason why that's important is because Peter, in the midst of it, is saying, this is what you need to have. This is what you needs to be in your attention. This is, needs to be in your thinking. This needs to be in your, your mindset because we overlook it. We forget it. And this causes us sometimes to go along with the people that question God is that sometimes we overlook the fact that God's timing is not our timing. The way that God works is not the way we expect him to work. Now, there's two elements of this uh, to take away. There, there's what I would call the small in the sense of the individual comfort. And then there's also then the big global comfort that we're to take from this. The, the, the individual small comfort is the reminder that God works in a way that we cannot perceive because his timing is always greater than ours. Now, what is wonderful is that God isn't limited by time. God made time for us. So the, 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 the sun and the moon and stuff like that, that is for us. That, that isn't for God. God isn't limited by time. God exists outside of time. So God is not limited in the way we are limited. So when we look at our days, we see the limited amount of hours, the minutes, the seconds, and we think to ourselves, well, God hasn't worked in this time. Panic. Well, what, what Peter is saying, actually, remember, no, no, God's not like that. He says, like, for God, a thousand years is like a, a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Now, that's not literal language, but it's to say to us, remember, God's thinking about time is never going to be like our thinking. And the small comfort is for us to be able to say, well, wonderfully in God's grace, God knows us, God cares for us, God loves us, and in his grace, he brings about good for his people. Therefore, even though his timing won't be like our timing, he still will do what he says he'll do. So when we get to the likes of Romans 8, 28, we're able to say, all things work together for good to them who love God. We're able to say, in God's timing, even though we don't think it's quick enough, it is right for him and according to what he does. But here's where the big part of it is. The big element is that when we look at the world, we have to remember that God is not restricted like us. So when he makes a promise, 
He is not obligated to do it in somebody's time frame, nor is he obligated to do it in somebody's lifeline. Now, in the case of promises and stuff, there was a bit of a joke over the weekend some people heard, but Esme at the weekend got very upset because she didn't get any chips. So on Friday, Esme wanted chips. She didn't get chips, and she was in tears. And hilariously, all we heard repeated was, chips, chips. And all. so this was going on for ages, going on, chips, chips, chips. And she was all upset. So I said, uh, when she woke up, you know, kind of, um, we'll, we'll have some chips. And, and sadly, she didn't get some chips. She's not at a point now to be able to say, articulate, oh, you said chips, so I haven't got it yet. But, but the main part is with it, okay? I'm limited by the time frame based on Esme's life. I'm limited on time frame based on my life. So when I make a promise, I can only do it in a fixed amount of time. That means that it's under the obligation of how long I can live. It's under the obligation of how long somebody else is around. So when I make a promise, it is so limited. But when God makes a promise that he's going to do something, he's not like that. God isn't sitting there, well, I've got a limited time frame. I've got a limited span of attention or something like that. It's not the case that the world's going to come to an end. God keeps the world. God upholds the world. So as long as God decides the world's going to exist, it will exist. So that when the moment comes, God in his judgment is going to bring it about. And at that time, it's going to seem quick. But in God's time frame, it's been for a long time that he's been promising it. But he is not obligated to do it as we think he should do it. That means that when people scoff and mock they're unable to say, I can see things the way God sees them. For them, they see it in their limited time frame. And they say, God has to fit into this. God looks at us and says, I don't need that time frame. I'm not limited by your time frame. I'm not limited by the scale of what you think I should do. Wonderfully, when we get to 2 Peter 3, God is saying to us, the world is under my control. It is in, under my authority. It's not going to end by you not doing things or doing things. It's not going to come to the final conclusion of its, of its cease, of its existence based on the people living in it. No, it's going to be based on when God decides. And it's based on something God already has decided. So we live knowing that God keeps his promises and knowing God keeps the word and to be able to rejoice that God in his grace allows us to share the gospel so that each day is a reminder this is God's kindness to us. This is God's grace to us. So when you read the news, when you hear the people say, oh, panic, we're able to say, no, well, hold on a second, that's not the case. When people say the world is going to be destroyed in 10 years, not only is it a case of being able to point out and say, well, how is that matched up with all the other uh, predictions in history? But we're able to say in reality, look at what God says here. Look at what God promises. It's going to come, but it's not as we expect it. It's not in the time frame that we think it is. But the other part as well is that wonderfully there is a bit of a comfort in God that God in his right good wisdom has a perfect timing. Uh, Jenny yesterday sent me a picture and I want to use this at the very end. It says, from whence can God relieve my care? Remember that omnipotence his, has servants everywhere. His method is sublime, his heart profoundly kind. God never is before his time and never is behind. It seems a bit strange, you know, in older English, you know, what does he mean? The writer says in that when they quote it, the writer saying, God is never early, God is never late. God is exactly when he decides and that is the time it will happen. So when we look at the world we're in, God has the right time. It's never early, never late. But wonderfully in our individual comfort, God in his timing will never be early or late for us as well. Wonderfully we're able to say in the strange enigma and mystery it is that God has the care of the whole creation. God upholds the whole world. But at the same time, he loves us as individuals. And he says, I will bring the best for my people. And I will do that in their own time frame. Wonderfully, God is beyond us. So when we see the scoffers, when we hear them mock, we hear them ridicule, we're able to say, there, our God is greater than they can imagine. Our God is more splendid than they can even begin to perceive. But we can tell them about him. Because he has graciously allowed, in his kindness, the life that they can live in the hope of repentance. So let's rejoice and give thanks that all is under God's control. Let's give thanks in those moments where we see the news and we get afraid, we get worried, we get nervous. God has it under his authority. Nothing will happen without God's allowing it or causing it. Therefore, as the world continues on, it continues on with us to live according to the promises he's given that we would go and share the good news, longing for people to repent in line with what God has intended for his creation. 
So let us do the work that he calls us to. Let us lift our eyes to see how good God is in his timing and his grace. And let us share the fact that God is never early. He is never late. He is always in time. Let's rejoice that God is not like us, limited and fixed like us in our time. With that in mind, we're going to stand. We're going to sing how deep the Father's love for us, how he fast beyond all measure that he would send his only son to die for us. So let's all stand to sing. I think it's 988 in the, in the books, but how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measures. So let's all stand to sing now. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. rejoice in your grace over us. But Father, we realize that living in this world that we hear so frequently about the chaos that we're in that uh, causes us sometimes to fear, to be worried. We realize for those at school, they'll hear it consistently. For those at work as well. And every time we look at the news, there's always something. Father, we pray for those moments to look to you, to see your character, your nature. Father, may our appreciation for who you are grow and develop. And in those times where we feel the limitation of our own lifespan, may we not question your abilities. May we see the grace that you give us. May we give thanks that you are a kind and loving God. But Father, for each of us here, we do pray for those moments individually for that comfort that you do work with us. But also as we look at the world globally, that everything keeps on going because you keep it. But one day this world will end. And one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. Father, may we look forward to that, each of us. May we hope in our Savior, knowing that he died for us to secure our right to be there. And may we delight ourselves with the fact that how good it will be to enjoy a perfect creation that we don't get to enjoy yet. So Father, we pray for us as we take our, our tea and coffee, as we chat more, and then as we go home, continue to speak to us. Help us to, to balance what we hear 
in the world to think how do you speak about it and how are we to think about it. Father, we thank you that you're never late. You're always on time. Father, we thank you you're never early either. We rejoice in your grace that you do things what is right and what is necessary. And we pray this all to the glory of your name. Amen. 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 Amen.